Well, welcome to 2024, everybody. Yeah, doesn't that sound good? Does that feel good? Some of you have had a great year already. Some of you already are looking forward to 2025. (laughs) But I'm going to tell you, you can restart right now. Because sometimes we feel like we have to wait till the beginning of the year to make everything new. But I want to tell you, the Bible says that God's mercies are new every morning. Every morning. That means even if you feel like you already blew it in 2024, I want to tell you his mercies are new today. Every morning. Today can be January 1st for you. It'll mess your calendar up a little bit, but that's okay. Today's January 1st. His mercies are new every morning. Say that with me. Every morning. Every morning. Every morning. Every year, the church on the way comes together. um, And we've been doing this for years and years from before I, I was here. Long, long, long time ago. Every year, the the Lord gives us a word and we declare a word over the year. The Spirit declares a word over the year that will be our theme throughout the year. Uh, Last year, our theme was foundations. And we declared the year of foundations. The Lord called us to that. And little did we know that we'd had a flood in this place a few weeks later and we'd be spending most of the year over in the prayer chapel, in the Hayford prayer chapel and re-engaging our foundations in the Lord. Wasn't that a great year last year? Learning our, the foundations, what, what causes us to follow him? What are, the, what are the solid rock principles that we get to stand on? And for a lot of you who have come to know the Lord more recently, that was really important for you to get some foundations in the Lord so that you can continue to grow. We've had years of um, next steps. What are, what are next steps? We've had years of, um, there was one year that we, when I was here that we entitled, uh, You're Not Alone. You're not alone. And that's, that's, it's, it's awkward semantically to say it's the year of you're not alone. But it was really important for us to understand that we're in this together and that there are opportunities for us to connect together. There was a year of restart. There were different years. Well, this year is the year we're going to declare a real simple year. It's the most profound thing in the world and it's the most simple thing in the world. And some of you may, when I tell you what the year is, you might go, well, isn't every year that year? And yes, every year is this year. But this year, we're going to focus really, really hard, really, really deep, really, really exclusively on this. At the Church on the Way, 2024 is the year of Jesus. Period. Jesus. Period. Because his name is great. His name is greater than any other name. We're going to focus on Jesus, period. Everybody say period. Period. That's really important there because I want to tell you today that Jesus is a complete sentence. The word Jesus is a complete thought, a complete sentence. It's not Jesus plus something. Jesus plus success. Jesus plus money. Jesus plus healing. Jesus plus pluck because sometimes we know that Jesus heals but we go well Jesus isn't enough unless everything turns out the way I want it to Jesus plus politics we need that one in 2024 don't we Jesus none of some of you didn't respond well Jesus it's not Jesus plus anything it's Jesus period Jesus period Jesus is enough Jesus is enough and we're going to spend all year figuring out how Jesus is enough. We sing praises to his name. For his name, Jesus, is great and greatly to be praised. For your name is great and greatly to be praised. Let's sing the whole song. I sing praises to your name. I sing praises to your name. Oh, Everybody 
Somebody say Jesus with me. Jesus. Jesus. We praise your name. Amen. 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 Thanks, you guys. Thanks so much. So it's the year of Jesus. Period. The year of Jesus. Listen, we're always going to talk about Jesus. It's, it's not going to end the end of this year. We always talk about Jesus. In fact, um, this February, uh, it was February 2nd in 2014 that was the Sunday, but this February, and it will be 10 years since Deborah and I came to pastor the church on the way. 10 years. And you can clap. That's fine. Yeah. I was going to tell you not to clap, but that's, that's okay. You can if you want to, but, um, but that's not the point. The point is 10 years ago, I stood up on, well, not this platform. It was it was very different. It was green. And uh, I stood up on the platform um, and I preached my first message and I talked about Jesus. I talked about Jesus and I talked about Jesus and I talked about Jesus. And I didn't know how much I was talking about Jesus. I must have talked about Jesus a whole lot because afterwards, one of the members of the church, one of the elders of this church approached me with tears in his eyes. Alex Acuna came up to me and he grabbed me on the shoulders and said, Pastor, Pastor, and he's crying. He says, Pastor, do you realize how many times you mention the name of Jesus in your sermon? I said, no. And he said, 37 times. I counted them. And, and I got to tell you, the message hasn't changed. When I came to the church, I resolved to know make Jesus known, and to preach Christ crucified. And I still resolve to make Jesus known and to preach Christ crucified. Amen. I believe that Jesus is the answer for every need that we have, for every need that the world has. Jesus is the answer. It's, all, it's not just me, you guys, though. It's not just me showing up 10 years ago deciding, hey, I got a good idea. Let's make this into a Jesus church. The church on the way has always been a Jesus church. It's always been a Jesus church from the very beginning when the church on the way, the, the church, the, the four square church in Van Nuys has been around for almost 100 years. In a couple of years, we're going to celebrate 100 years. We look pretty good for 100, I'm telling you. Um, but 50 something years ago when Pastor Jack showed up to the church uh, and started kind of refounded the church, kind of, re, kind of restarted it. There were, there were a few handfuls of people here, and they were really faithful, great people. But there was a new season, and that season would come to be called the Church on the Way. Uh, during that season, there were young people all over the city of L.A. It was part of the hippie movement, and it was in the late 60s and the early 70s, and there were people all over the place that were looking for some spiritual direction. They were looking for something to find that would say, hey, we're lost and we need to find a way home. We need to find spiritual direction. So that's where the Jesus people movement started. It was during that season. And people were coming in droves to the church on the way over in the prayer chapel. And they were showing up and they were showing up, you know, barefoot. And they were showing up, you know, maybe high. And they were showing up, you know, in all kinds of ways that right now in the church, maybe we would say, whoa, you know, don't show up like that. Well, some of you are saying, don't show up like that. You showed up like that. <laughs> so don't forget that when people come in their brokenness and people come in their seeking, that we, we, we welcome them with open arms. But in that period of time, there were also other churches and other organizations and other um, cults, and there was a lot going on spiritually all over Southern California. And those places weren't always focused on Jesus. They might have the name church on them, but they didn't have Jesus as the center. They didn't have the word of God as the center. And so Pastor Jack, who was called to pastor a Jesus church at some point in the early history of the church on the way, started at the end of every service singing a song. All hail the power of Jesus name. Let angels prostrate, prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Say that with me. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Pastor Jack, who, by the way, passed away one year ago this Sunday, today. Um, was, yes, tomorrow in the date, but in the Sundays it was today. Declared by his, the word that he preached and by the church that he led and by the song that they sang at the end of every service, that Jesus was Lord, 
that Jesus was king, that Jesus was enough. And I'm a pastor who walks into that reality, and I've bet everything, my ministry life, my last 35 years of ministry, I've bet it all on one reality, and that's this, that when people encounter the risen Jesus Christ, everything in their life's going to change. When people truly encounter the risen Lord, everything changes. When people encounter the supernatural power and presence of the risen Lord, everything changes in their life, and then they want to start changing because God has made them new. That's, amen, we can clap for that. Here's the reality, church. We preach Jesus and him crucified and risen again. And we want people to encounter the risen Lord. And when they truly encounter him, then they want to start giving their lives to him. They surrender to him. Listen, you can be hanging out in the room when Jesus is present and not truly encounter him. But when God has gotten a hold of your heart, then everything changes. So we're not preaching to people to try to get them to change. We're preaching to people and we're welcoming them into a radical encounter with the risen Jesus Christ. And then we preach discipleship for those people who have given their hearts to the Lord and want to surrender to him. There is a way. Jesus said, everybody who listens to my words and puts them into practice is going to be like a person that builds their life on the rock. So we're trying to help people listen to the Lord's voice, put those words into practice. But first of all, we want people to encounter Jesus because how many of you know it's impossible to put Jesus' words into practice unless you've been regenerated by the Holy Spirit? you got to encounter the risen Jesus first. And that's what we're all about is helping people encounter Jesus because everything changes. In John 20, 20, the disciples saw the risen Lord. They were hopeless. They were uh, without hope. They were with, without faith. They were without anything. They were hiding behind closed doors. And when they saw the risen Lord, it says that they were overjoyed. How many of you want to be overjoyed in 2024? 2024, that's what it is, 2024. In John 12, we see a story where Jesus is getting close to going to his death. Um, and uh, he's, he's part of, of he's, he's at a crowd. There's a festival going on. And it says that in John 20, 20, that there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was one of the disciples. He was from Bethsaida and in Galilee with a request. And they said, sir, we would like to see Jesus. We would like to see Jesus. These outsiders, they were probably Jewish converts that had come to the festival to celebrate, but they were still ethnically Gentiles. They were Greeks. And these outsiders who were not insiders, who were not part of Jesus' inner circle, they came to Jesus' disciples. How many of you in here are Jesus' disciples? They came not to Jesus first. They first came to his disciples. And they came to one of his disciples and said, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. Can you arrange that? And I want to tell you something that we believe in a year in 2024 where not only the church on the way is the way of Jesus, period, but it's a year where people are going to find you as a disciple and they're going to say, I'd like to encounter Jesus. Can you arrange it? Can you arrange it? I want to see Jesus. And I believe that people want to see Jesus, even if they don't know they want to see Jesus. I think the deepest cry of anybody's heart is that they would encounter with the God that created them and that loves them and sustains them and provides for them and that wants to save them and wants them for eternity in heaven in his family. People want to see Jesus, but I want to tell you something else, that even if you're a disciple, I want the cry of our heart to be every day, I want to see Jesus. I want to see Jesus. It's not just about the outsiders. It's about the insiders because sometimes as an insider, as somebody who's known Jesus for a while, you stop having the cry in your heart that you want to see Jesus. You want to see a lot of other things happen in the world. But I want to become a church that every morning each of us gets up in the morning and the first thing we say out of our lips is, Jesus, I want to see you. I want to see you today. I want to encounter you. I want to know you. That's the target. That's the target. I want to know you, Lord. Everything I'm doing is focused in on knowing you, on being targeted in you. And by the way, it's really interesting that the word sin isn't just about prideful, willful rebellion. That's part of sin. But the word sin also can mean missing the mark. And if my mark is Jesus, if he's the red dot in the middle of the target, and I miss that, 
that I'm missing the point. And Paul says, I want to lay aside everything that, that, that entangles me. Actually, we don't know if that was Paul. That's in Hebrews. I want to lay aside everything that entangles me. Paul says in Philippians, I want to press on for that thing that God took me a hold of. Jesus took a hold of my heart so that I can press on and know him and know the power of his suffering and know the fellowship of his suffering and the power of his resurrection. I want to know Jesus. Anything that gets us distracted from that, anything that takes us our eyes off of Jesus is sin and we want it rid of. I want to know Jesus. I want people to know Jesus. That's what the Greeks said. And then in John 12, 32, just down, down in the same air, Jesus starts to respond to this request and he starts talking about his death. He starts talking about how he's going to die. He starts talking about how he's going to go to the cross and how it's going to save people and how it's going to bring life to people. And he says this in verse, John, in verse 32 of John 12. He says, now this, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He was lifted up on the cross and he started drawing people to himself. I want to tell you, that's, that's the main thing, is lifting up Jesus. Lifting up Jesus. I want to be a church that exalts Jesus and lifts him up. And then as we lift up Jesus in our praise, as we lift up Jesus and who he is, as we exalt Jesus, as we make much of Jesus, do you know what happens? Jesus draws people to himself. We don't have to draw people. I hope we're a church that invites people. I hope we're a church that says, come to a place where Jesus is going to be present and you're going to encounter him. All of that's important. But at the end of the day, we're not the one that creates salvation. Jesus draws all men and women to himself as we lift up Jesus. So I want to be a church that lifts up Jesus. Church, the church on the way is a Jesus church, not a cool church. All right? I'm not looking for us to be a cool. I'm not, nothing wrong with cool. If you're cool, I'm glad you're here. You can teach me a thing or two, okay? Nothing wrong with cool, but we're not looking to be a cool church we're looking to be a church that exalts Jesus and points people to Jesus. Amen? The church on the way is not looking to be a political church. We're looking to be a Jesus church. And I want to explain that for a second because some of you go, well, isn't, shouldn't we talk about politics sometimes when we talk about Jesus? Absolutely, but not from a perspective of right or left. In fact, we will talk about politics that come to Jesus when Jesus says, this is how I want you to live. We're going to talk about how we're supposed to live. But I want to tell you, when you start following Jesus' way, you're going to offend both Democrats and Republicans. You're going to offend both right and left. Because when you say, I'm not interested in one side or the other, I'm interested in what Jesus is interested in. And so I have political opinions, and I think they're right. By the way, all of us think our political opinions are right. But I want to tell you that I want to submit those to Jesus Christ and him crucified. We're not looking to be a relevant church. Listen, I have nothing against relevancy. I have nothing against politics. I have nothing against cool. But I don't want to be a relevant church. I want to be a Jesus church. Because I think when Jesus is glorified and when his presence is strong in our midst, that everything that people are facing is going to be answered. Every question that's out there is going to be answered. I don't want to look to be a relevant church. I could keep going on and on and on, but you get the point. I want to be a lit church that lifts up Jesus. Jesus draws people to himself because he is the door to God. He is the door to God. I want to, I want to make this clear, and we're going to just do this really quickly. In fact, I'm going to ask a question because I'm just really terrible at math. For the timer, do I have five minutes in my sermon left or is it five minutes with everything left? Okay. Because I was about ready to be like, all right, let's go, everybody. I don't, five minutes, okay. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. When I say we're a Jesus church, I want to be really clear. We're not a Jesus only church. Jesus only says, well, Jesus is 
everything. There's a theology out there that's called Jesus only. And it's like, we're going to worship Jesus only. And, and the father actually was the father. And then he became Jesus. And then he became the Holy Spirit. And it's really only one person. But the, the, the concept of the Trinity in the Bible, it's such a mysterious concept, but it's all over the place. And that the church has understood for centuries and centuries is that God is one in three different expressions. God is one. Say that with me. God is one, but in three different persons, okay? And so when we talk about Jesus, what we recognize is that Jesus is our door to a relationship with this triune God. Three expressions, three persons, eternally co-equal, eternally co-powerful, co-eternal, always together, but they are expressed this way. Number one, the Father we find in John 14, 9, that if we've seen Jesus, we've seen the Father. So if I want to know what the Father looks like, if I want to know something about the Father, it says that Jesus said, if you've seen me, he's talking to Philip, his disciple, you've seen the Father. In John 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, but the Word was also God. In Colossians 1, it says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. That image word image means icon. So when you look at Jesus, you can see all that the Father is. If you want to know what God thinks of you, look in the Bible at what Jesus thinks of people and how he treated people and how he loved people. If you want to understand who the Father is, the doorway to that is through the Son. And so this year we're going to talk about the Son because the Son glorifies the Father and the Son is Jesus, but we're going to look at the Son Jesus in the New Testament, in the Gospels, as he was alive on the earth. We're also going to look at Jesus in the Old Testament. Did you know that before Jesus had the name Jesus, that he showed up all over the Old Testament? It's called the Angel of the Lord, and we're going to take a look at where Jesus shows up in the Old Testament and how he shows up and expresses himself pre-incarnate, before he had a body. And we're also going to take a look at Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who is going to rule and reign forever and ever and ever, after life is over. So that's Jesus. And the third person of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. And we're told that if we surrender everything to Jesus, if we open our hearts to Jesus, if we change our lives, if we let him change our lives, that God who is changing our life is God the Holy Spirit because in Ephesians 1.13 it says that the Spirit has been given to those of us who have come to Jesus as a seal of our salvation. The Holy Spirit lives in us. Listen, at Christmas last month we celebrated God with us. But when Jesus rose and then ascended to the Father, the Father and the Son sent the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, not just to be with us, but to live in us. So if I've opened my heart to the Lord, the Holy Spirit, God, lives in me, and He is the one working out the regenerating power, making me new, making me fresh, dwelling in me. And that's really good. So Jesus is our entry point, our door to God, the one that offers relationship with the Father, the one that offers fullness in the Holy Spirit. And if we give our lives to him and surrender to him, that's how that's going to happen. Our relationship, by the way, we're adopted into the family of the Father. The Father becomes our Father when we're adopted through Jesus Christ. Is anybody glad about that? Can anybody celebrate that? Anybody love that? Jesus is our first love. We're called to love Jesus. The very first song I ever learned in my life, the song that the doctor was singing as I was born. Seriously, we had a Christian doctor and he was singing this song and then my mom taught it to me when I was like one something. I don't know. I don't know when kids start talking and I was like one. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. I haven't always followed Jesus perfectly, but all of my life. That's what I've wanted. I just want to love Jesus because he first loved me. 
In Revelation 2, we find a church, the church of Ephesus. The church of Ephesus, we spent a lot of time in Ephesians last year because there's a lot of foundational stuff there. There was a lot, of, there was a lot written to the church of Ephesus that they were going to be strong in the Lord. They were going to learn to grow founded deep in their faith, rooted and established in their faith. The church at Ephesus is important in the New Testament because not only do the Ephesians, uh, the, the book of Ephesians written to it, but Pastor Timothy, is, first and second Timothy, Paul writes this letter to Timothy who's been assigned as the pastor of the church of Ephesus. So this church is really important. It's really strong. But by the time we get to Revelation, there's a letter written to the church of Ephesus. And I want to read it to you because I think it's a letter for us today. It says, these are the words of him who hold the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. By the way, this is a letter. There are seven letters that were dictated to the Apostle John on the island of Patmos. And he writes to seven different churches. And Jesus has something to say to each of those churches. Sometimes they're encouraging. Sometimes they're challenging. Sometimes they're full of discipline. Sometimes they're full of grace. They're always full of grace. But to the church, this really important church of Ephesus, he writes these words. I know your deeds your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and you have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Man, how many of you want to be that church, right? I mean, you read this and you realize that they got their morality figured out. They're not putting up with immoral behavior. They've got their theology figured out. They're not putting up with people that are teaching wrong things. And, they, and they've even had to face persecution, political persecution. This is a church that's pretty strong, pretty significant, seems to be doing everything right, making all the right choices. And yet Jesus goes on to say this, yet I hold this against you. You've forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has hears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Church, we might do a lot of things right. We can get our morality right. We can get our theology right. We can get our politics right. We can be facing persecution. But I want to tell you that if we get everything right and we lose our first love, then we've gotten everything wrong. If we get everything right and we walk away from being passionately in love with Jesus, then we've got everything wrong. Jesus says, repent. Come back to the things you did at first. Remember how when you first came to me, I talked about some of you who years ago walked into this place with bare feet and too much substances in your system. And you remember what you did to love Jesus because he first loved you. I want to tell you something. If we can be a people who learn to love Jesus, who come back to him, who give our hearts to him, who fall in love with him, who repent from the things we've done, who repent from those things that we think are more important... We learn how to return to our first love church. This message is so important in 2024. There is going to be a lot of distraction from coming back to our first love. We're going to want to make everything else more important than Jesus. Can I tell you that this year at the Church on the Way, this is the year of Jesus, period. Period. And we're going to fall in love with Jesus. We're going to hit the target and shed everything else that entangles us. Deborah, can I have us this communion? Thanks. We're going to come to the table of the Lord right now. You would have received this as you walked in. If you didn't receive it, you can put your hand up and an usher or somebody will come and, and help. So there's a few people up here in the front row that maybe uh, some, some of our greeter team can help out with. Um, but we're going to receive communion a little bit differently than we normally do. We're going to do it together. We always do it together during a song and you examine your heart and then take it as, receive it as you want to. But today we're going to receive it together, together. That's actually, I think, the intent that Jesus had when he instituted communion. In fact, in 
1 Corinthians 11, we find out that the church was to take and receive communion together and come to the Lord's table and remember what he did on the cross together, that some were doing it early and some were doing it late. And Paul says, hey, don't, don't do that. Do it together. There's a reason for that. It's because we're a body together. When I say that this is the year of Jesus, it's the year of Jesus, not just for you or me, one of you or one of me. I guess there's only one of me. <laughs> this is for all of us. It's for all of us. We're together coming to Jesus. Listen, regardless of your background, regardless of what you believe politically, regardless of where you work, regardless of how much money you have or don't have, regardless of anything that identifies your life, I want to tell you something. The church on the way is first identified with the fact that we come to the feet of Jesus together. We come to the cross of Jesus together. Can you open that side that has the bread in it? Take out that piece of bread. The bread that's broken represents Jesus' body that was broken for us. We can talk about all kinds of areas of wholeness that Jesus wants for us. His body was broken so we could live whole, so that we can have peace, so that we could have shalom in our bodies, in our souls, in our lives, so that we could be saved, body, mind, and spirit. But one of the realities of Jesus' broken body was this. In 1 Corinthians 11, it says that the body of Christ is recognized when we receive communion. The body of Christ, meaning not Jesus' earthly, physical body, but his body that exists in the church right now. We are the body of Christ. And Jesus' body was broken so that we could be whole and we could be unified. So we receive this together as we declare, Jesus, this is your year. We're giving you this year. And as I say receive, we're going to receive it together. Lord, thank you so much for your body that was broken for us. Bring us into unity and wholeness today as we declare that Jesus is enough. Let's receive together. Go ahead and carefully open the, the cup part. In the Old Testament, the people of God were told that they had to have animal sacrifices when they were asking for forgiveness of sin. And it wasn't that the animal sacrifice would actually forgive sin. There was no amount of animal sacrifice that could ever do that. But God was reminding his people that all sin leads to death. All sin requires death. It, it, sin becomes death. And so they were reminded of that over and over again as they were sacrificing animals. And by the way, it wasn't just ritual sacrifice. They went on to eat those animals and um, make them meals. But the, but the very issue of bringing them to death was reminding them of their own sin. And when Jesus came, he was the perfect lamb of God. And while not a lamb or a bull could ever truly forgive sin, Jesus, who was the perfect lamb of God, poured out his blood in death so that we wouldn't have to keep experiencing the death that we'd embraced. And it says that he traded his perfect life for ours. And when we receive the cup, we remember that Jesus' life is given to us. Amen? So Lord, thank you for your forgiveness and your grace. We receive. Before we do, before anybody receives, just with your eyes closed, I want to say this. Maybe you're in the room and you don't know Jesus. Maybe you're watching online and you don't know Jesus. You don't have communion with you but you can do this too. Listen, as you receive this cup, if you know that you need to give your heart to the Lord, if you know you need to make a decision to follow him, is that we've been talking about who Jesus is. You've said, I need a relationship with Jesus. I need to walk through the door to God. I need my life to be new. Or maybe you would say, I've done that before, but I've turned around and walked far away. And in 2024, I want to start fresh with Jesus. I want to start fresh with Jesus. When we receive this together, you're receiving it and you're saying by receiving it, Lord, I'm saying yes to you. So Lord, thank you for your death on the cross for us, for your life that you offered us through your resurrection. In Jesus' name, let's receive. Okay. Now, I want to know this. I'm not having anybody close their eyes. It's okay. Be bold. If you said yes to Jesus, you're either saying yes to Jesus, I'm, I'm coming to Jesus for the first time, I'm saying yes to him. 
or you're saying 2024 is the year that I'm getting serious about following Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus today. Listen, you may have been a church person all your life. You might even be an elder in the church and you're saying today there's something that hit me in my heart and I am deciding to follow Jesus in a really fresh way. This is a new decision for me. I'm not just talking about those of us who continually decide to follow Jesus. Thank you. We do that. But this is a turning point for you. I want you to say, that's me, and raise your hand. I'm following Jesus in a new way right now. Okay, yeah, I see you, I agree with you, yeah, yeah, I agree with you, and you, and you, and you, I agree with you guys. Yes, I agree with you, I agree with you. Yes, you're following Jesus in a new and a fresh way today. It's a brand new day, it's a brand new year. I agree with you. For those of you saying yes for the first time, we are so happy that you're saying yes to Jesus. In fact, let's clap again for them. In a minute, somebody's going to tell you how to take steps to learn how to follow him. But I also want to ask you this, with our eyes wide open. Some of you, you're following Jesus, but you're following Jesus, comma, and something else. You're following Jesus, comma, and cool. You're following Jesus, comma, and success. You're following Jesus, comma, and money. You're following Jesus, comma, and politics. You're following Jesus, comma, and relevancy. I don't know what it is, but you're following Jesus and you're putting something else on the same level of Jesus. And today you would say, I respond to Jesus and declare that today Jesus period is gonna be enough for 2024. If that's you, put your hand up, okay? Lord, there are so many of us who are responding today and we're declaring that this is a year where you alone are worthy to be praised and to be worshiped and we surrender everything to you. Lord, we want a supernatural encounter with you this year. God, we ask for it. In fact, if you're here and you want in 2024 for Jesus to truly encounter you, and I'm talking about a supernatural, you know that you know that you know that Jesus encountered your heart. You know there is nothing else about that except that Jesus showed up and he talked to you and he met you and he encountered you and he changed your life supernaturally in ways that you couldn't do it. If you want that this year, I want you to stand to your feet. Everybody stand to your feet that wants that. Lord, I'm standing to my feet. I want a supernatural encounter with you, Lord, this year. Jesus, we open up our hearts and we ask that you would encounter us in ways that we've never been encountered before this year, Lord. Lord, even those of us who have been serving you for 50 years and plus and more, Lord, that we would have a fresh new encounter, that you would create new wineskins of our lives, Lord, that we would return to our first love. Lord, we want to encounter you and we want you to encounter us. Lord, we speak the name of Jesus. Let's sing this song together again as we declare we want to encounter God. Hallelujah, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Praise your name, Lord God. We worship you, Lord. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus, shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name. Shine through the 
Lord, would you truly encounter us this year, God, in supernatural ways as we gather week by week here. Lord, as we spend time before you, Lord, we declare that this year is a year where we're going to follow you passionately, Lord, intentionally, and we ask that you would do a great work in us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.